Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Good morning, everybody. Go to strengthguild.com, S-T-R-E-N-G-T-H-G-U-I-L-D.com. Scroll down to the Iron Radio Collections, and we've got new shirts and new banners for you to support the show. Everything from just a regular banner, regular shirt, to ones with sayings on them, like Lonnie's Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree shirt. And some news for you, we're going to have some contests for people who own these shirts and things. So if you support the show, we'll let you more on that later. So if you get in on these early, you can be one of the first people to win some prizes. So, thank you very much. Go check out the site, strengthguild.com. Scroll down to Iron Radio Collections and support the show. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm an exercise physiology and sports nutrition professor of about 20 years, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. This is Phil Stevens, a powerlifter strength coach, and I'm fresh out of the mountains. So, I was gone for a couple weeks. Nice. You smell mountain fresh now? Uh, I do. I do. Nice. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Mike T. Nelson, uh, professor at the Kerrig Institute and creative flex diet cert, a bunch of other stuff. And uh, I'm still at home, which is amazing. I'm almost on a new record, getting close. Hey. Yeah, it's been a good time of year for that, you know. Yeah. Try to stay at home at least a little. Um, Oh, in fact, a couple of announcements here for listeners. Uh, If you are a longtime listener or recent, um, I've got some audio gifts for you so i i was talking about this the other day about how how often you know a bank or somewhere new they'll try to entice you with a gift if you're new and i always thought that was a little backwards what about people who are long time strong supporters you know so Mm -hmm. if you just send me an email it's lawnman7 at hotmail.com um or you could do it through ironradio.org you can get a hold of fortress and he still dutifully sends me everything you know he's alive um, <laughs> <laughs> could have fooled me. <laughs> right, I know for sure. Um, but the point being is, um, simply email me, and I'll send you back links that nobody else really gets, or uh, I'll send you back a way to cash in on this. And so there's different information products that are topical, um, and I'll give you all of them. There's three of them actually, and I think maybe one listener, maybe two, has sort of asked about this. So I thought. Anybody who's interested, um, you know, simply ask, and it'll be a, a little thank you um, for that. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to touch on quickly is there's been quite a bit of subscriber and donor activity this fall, both coming and going. And sometimes I'm such a curmudgeon or Phil will say something offensive <laughs> online, <laughs> and then somebody like, you know, uh, unsubscribes. Now, it may not be that at all, right? I, I've had people that I actually thanked about, hey, thanks for supporting this show while you could. And they're like, oh, you know, thanks, man. Yeah, I just, I had to start saving money for X, Y, Z. Great, that's fine. So my point of all this is Iron Radio is always free, right? Whether you come, you go, you support us or you don't, it's free. Um, That's kind of the point, really, Mm -hmm. uh, compared to a lot of other fitness uh, setups. So just a way to give back. You know, we're all... We're old enough to, you know, this is not our first rodeo, and, and we can save some people time and and grief, you know, just by talking shop and doing news and having guests. So, but that's the uh, the announcements. Phil, do you want to share anything about your, your trip? I mean, that must have been a, a great boon to your recovery and everything else. Oh, yeah, aside from sitting in a car so, so much. But we were in eight states in 10 days, so... Um, a lot of driving, but, uh, yeah, no, had a blast. I did a lot of like hiking around the mountains, a lot of sledding, a lot of, uh, took the kids snowboarding and then just relaxing. I became the, the, uh, 2019 ping pong champion of West Yellowstone. (laughs) (laughs) I beat all the kids. So, um, yeah, no, it was just mainly just relaxing. And then I, I didn't, I think I posted two things on Facebook the whole 10 days. 
and, Yay, and people good. know where like, so I totally detached from the devices and everything. I took three pictures. It was like I'm not even taking pictures. I'm just remembering this stuff. So Yeah. Uh, no, it was great. It was much needed. So it's good to be back, but yeah. Right on. Not I mean not to sound one dimensional, but I think that was almost ideal for like recovery for your lifting and stuff, right? Oh, because yeah. Yeah, it's uh, activity. It's you didn't just sit in a bed, you know. Yeah, no. Uh, no, my son would not allow that. <laughs> so <laughs> There you go. When you said so many states in so many days, I'm thinking that's that's how Mike lives most of the year. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Planes, trains, and automobiles. Yeah. Yes, that's true. I was actually at home and cleaning the garage to get a freezer today, finally, to do a cold water immersion. So I'm going to fill it with water and sit in it and see what happens. Can't you just, like, <laughs> You're such a can't scientist. You just, like, can't you just go outside and like sit in the snow? I've been doing that too. The okay. started texting us like that. Um, is it all right? Make sure he doesn't go out when it's really cold out. This is not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> just experimenting all the time, you know. Because uh, I go sit outside with just a t-shirt on after I got done lifting for five to ten minutes, just yeah. to meditate outside. So, but yeah, that gets a little chilly when it gets colder here. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, I got a dumbbell rack for Christmas, so that was exciting for me. Oh, nice. So, That's cool. Uh, it's actually, you know, it's highly rated. It's, it's real heavy duty. It's not huge, right, because I don't need something huge. But, um, yeah, it sort of makes my basement set up because I really just have some uprights for the most part. And it just makes the whole thing look more official, <laughs> I guess. There you go. And but, you have dumbbells to go in it, I assume, right? Yeah, I mean, at home, I, because I have a gym membership, my home stuff is just for when I, either I don't feel like going to the gym or I can't or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I have, like, I think I have, like... 20 pound increments like 20s 40s 60s you know that dumbbell set up like that oh, that's not bad uh and i just started fleshing out the interim 10 pound increments so i just got a pair of 30 pound dumbbells you know cause sometimes there's some things like lateral raises or something you, you you just don't want to grab a pair of 40s or 60s I, I mean i'm not doing full range of motion laterals <laughs> with 40 pound dumbbells Oof, um yeah. anyway um yeah so that was cool oh and you know i actually uh just a possible heads up in case uh, he's listening, but there's been a development in Northeast Ohio, which I think is sort of interesting. Um, I went up and I talked to Dean Caputo, who is a former, uh, God, he was a national competitor in the spotlight for the longest time, sort of local hero, really, because he was a national spotlight, like, you know, bodybuilding competitor who eventually turned pro. Uh, I think I would argue he did most of his influence on the national stage. I mean, we had Bob Ciccarello on ages ago and he was sort of oh, like yeah. sort of like that kind of um high caliber but did most of the influence I, I would argue actually in the npc right not the ifbb uh, but he's opening a new powerhouse gym in the area right down the street from his old one and it's just interesting because a lot of the old time guys hardcore guys will come back and uh he's got it actually separated from he's got hammer for the gen pop people uh, and then you know so the the large bearded, bearded off-season guys don't intimidate <laughs> the the normies. <laughs> He's got a wall between them, kind of. You know, it's just sort of interesting how it's getting set up. So, uh, we'll try to get him on the show. Uh, talk about old days and new. He had some interesting comments about how women are getting so involved in as far as hardcore lifting and that kind of stuff. Whereas before, you wouldn't see women in a lot of hardcore gyms. Maybe think about what Phil. You know, so many of his uh, members are now women uh, yep. and stuff like that. Okay, Uh, so everybody, we have a a light show. We're not going to do news or anything. I've got some predictive news, like what's coming down the pike. We can share that next week. I just want to do a 2020 prediction quickfire. Long-time listeners know that sometimes we will do these where I give either or uh, questions to the guys, and we just kind of then let those be seeds for conversation. So that's what we're going to do after a couple of these. I think we'll go through about five of these. Then we'll go to the mid-show break. Then we'll do uh, five more. So the the first set here of our uh, 2020 prediction quick fire questions uh, is more on the fitness industry. So, Phil, let's start with you. Uh, I know you've been away from it for a while, so fresh perspective. Um, So gen pop, the general population, weights or cardio uh, as far as trends and coming down the pike, what do you think? Ugh. 
Well, I would like to say way. I would like to say way, but no, it's still going to be cardio. Cardio is always going to win out. I mean, you can. That's very evident by like going to a Spartan race, and there's twenty thousand people doing it yes. versus like a meet where there's a hundred and sixty. So uh, weights would have to make up a lot of ground to become even close. But I think it's on an upward trend still. Yeah, it's becoming more popular. But as far as like which one's going to win out, of course, cardio is. It's yeah. just the Spartan thing influenced me too, and you know, there was that Velotron, no, uh, Peloton. Um, yeah. The Velotron's the lab bike. Yeah. The, the Peloton <laughs> like controversy and so much of the exercise thing about like tech modified, you know, cardio equipment. Yep. Uh, so yep. that's the stuff that seems to get the national news. It's not going to be my new thirty pound hex dumbbells, <laughs> nope. you know, kind of thing. Uh, Mike, what about you uh, as far as trends? You think resistance and weights or cardio? Um... Yeah, I mean, I'd love to say weights, and I, th- I think it's gotten better, and I'd probably credit CrossFit for most of that over the past five to ten years. But, I mean, you go to, like, to a brand-new gym, and I always look at, okay, what did they invest in equipment? And cardio you know, equipment, treadmills, that kind of stuff, they're expensive. Mm-hmm. You know, not that, you know, you know, lifting equipment is cheap either, but... You walk in and you're just like row after row after row of treadmills. Like, oh, mm-hmm. oh. Yeah. like at least get some rowers or something <laughs> or something else. But I don't know. So I think based on that and yeah, I'd say probably still cardio. And I even hate to call it cardio because it's just people in there doing the exact same thing every day on a treadmill. Yes, so. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I used to think that when I was competing too, I would do more of a – you know, like the morning fasted walk and stuff like that, just to try to keep my body weight under yeah. control or whatever. And that's not cardio per se. I mean, everything is cardio in a sense, right? But yeah, when I think about like intensity, that wasn't the point at all. It was just sort of active recovery and a little bit of fat burning, you know, but. Um, Stag- uh, stagnant locomotion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gonna walk to nowhere. Like, that's right. Yeah. Seems like an oxymoron, but it's sort of the point. Yeah. <laughs> and I have this whole thing where I think that being on a treadmill causes your body some little bit of neurologic confusion, so to speak, because your joints and all your proprioception is saying, hey, we're moving. And then your visual system's like, no, we're not, dumbass. We're in the <laughs> same spot we were before. And when you do that with gait, I think it's, it's, kind of does funny stuff like just watch anyone who's been on a treadmill for a while like the first couple of steps they take getting off the treadmill yeah. they looked like they had a few too many to drink where yep. i think a rower or a bike or something like that is, is so different from gate that you probably don't have to worry about any of that type of weird interference but that's just one of my weird pet peeves yeah as people merge with technology in so many ways it there is some weirdness and i agree i mean think about like in cardiac rehab uh when i was out in san diego you'd get people on the treadmill who've never been on one and they think yeah. the lawnmower push, you know, they get yeah. on it and they're, it, it's very, it's actually very weird until you tell your body, no, I'm kind of tricking you, right? It, it feels like gate, but like you said, visual perception, it's not. And yeah, kind of yeah. weird. We don't need as much glute max hamstring. We'll just stand here and let our leg get dragged into extension. Who cares? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> so, so I tell you what people need to do is go find some hip deep snow and go walk through it. Holy crap. That's a workout. I oh, totally. that with my son. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking from experience, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no doubt. Uh, actually, you know, I was actually I was talking to my son the other day about how now this I don't mean like annual trend, but like decade long trend. One of the things that sometimes I actually lament, uh, there's pros and cons, of course, is how weights used to be a brotherhood, whether it was powerlifting. Uh, or bodybuilding, and people knew each other. Like, there was sort of a well-kept secret, you know, how awesome it was. And when resistance training bled into the gen pop to such an extent it is, you get, you know, sort of the, that's where the gym bros came from, right? It, It wasn't the hardcore people who most of them were, aspiring to compete or admiring c- competitors it seemed more athletic in a way whereas now it's just to to have biceps for so you can go clubbing and look good you know and that's not bad <laughs> like there's some good yeah. things about that but i also lament the good old days where somehow it seemed more serious um I, I, or driven by a sense of purpose like tom platts would talk about a calling you know kind of thing and i don't know so yeah I mean, I would agree with that. I even think back to when I was doing my uh, master's and postgrad stuff at Michigan Tech, which was back in the 90s. They, the general weight room for the non-athletes at the college was just 
pretty pitiful. <laughs> yes. Yep. So luckily, a bunch of hardcore lifters rented out a place from the university, actually, in the bottom of one of the dormitories. And they paid the university, I don't know what it was for rent, and they charged people $15 a quarter. You know, pretty, very inexpensive. Mm-hmm. But it was just enough that he only had people who were pretty serious about lifting. And it wasn't like the greatest gym ever, but it was good enough. You know, yeah. you had a couple racks, you had a cable crossover and a few basic machines. And it was just interesting because a couple times I did have to go to this the general gym. It was completely different mm-hmm. atmosphere. Atmosphere. You know, the yeah, the yeah. private one, we could, you know, play whatever music we wanted. So there's just this little lineup where you'd put your CD up there when you came in. And once one was done, they'd just stick in whatever was the next CD. So, yeah, uh, yeah. But very different atmosphere, I think, just from the there's a barrier that you had to kind of overcome. Not much of one, but enough just to kind of keep the people who weren't super serious about it out. Yeah. I mean, at Kent State, there was the Lake Hall weight room. And I mean, it was really just bench pressing, squats. I mean, there was the old universal you know, like those silvery yeah. plate load things, but like very yep. old school, blaring 80s and 90s rock, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, and how different that was. And they would even host, like every year they sponsored and hosted like a campus-wide bodybuilding competition and stuff. I mean, and now, yeah, the big trend in universities, of course, are, are these mega fitness centers and student centers, mm-hmm. you know, and it's it's not the same thing at all. Uh, so yeah. anyway, um. Number two, Phil, um, this is sort of an offshoot of that one. Trending uh, forward, CrossFit or strength power offshoots of CrossFit, if that makes any sense. That makes sense. I would go with the second, the strength power offshoots. I think CrossFit's on a pretty good downswing, and you're seeing a lot of people exodus from that and try out different things. Mm -hmm. So even, even internally, there are people from the CrossFit that are like, Oh, this is neat, but let's try this. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, you're seeing the strength sports on a rise, and a lot of it is coming from that. Um, they're getting their taste uh, within CrossFit, and then deciding they like this. And you're seeing a lot of the. I would tell. I always tell people the better CrossFit boxes now are all offering more than CrossFit, the ones yeah. that are making it. So. Yeah. Yeah. In fact. Um, my conversation with Dean Caputo and those guys at the new powerhouse, it echoed exactly what you just said. He just felt like CrossFit was sort of on the way down, like on decline Mm -hmm. in a sense, in its native form, at least, you know? Yes. Uh, Mike, same thing. I mean, you travel so much. Yeah. I mean, I would agree with that. I would say, especially within the last couple of years. I mean, part of that I think has to do with the way CrossFit has kind of gone about their, their business the past Mm -hmm. couple of years, especially with, (laughs) changes to the games and um i know the granite games here was was sold to one of the guys who runs wadapalooza and other things like that so my my prediction is that the the granite games or what becomes of that will probably replace the crossfit games i think i know that's kind of a little bit out there but Mm -hmm. i think if something like that happens and crossfit's a little bit kind of in this weird area where before you could always kind of point to the games and be like okay here's the you know, highly competitive arm of this. We may not be doing that, but people have exposure to it. They kind of know, you know, what it is. If that kind of goes away or changes, it's, I think, a little bit of different of a, an identity, too, even if that was never your goal to begin with. And like Phil said, the people I know who run CrossFit gyms, like, you know, some of them I know haven't even renewed their affiliate. They've changed their name, so they don't have to kind of follow any of the, the rules, per se. Not that there was a whole lot. Oh. And they're offering all sorts of other things now and even other people who just kept the name uh there have much more variety now i know crossfit gyms that have yoga and all sorts of stuff now too so yeah interesting um yeah uh number three just so we can keep moving here uh let me preface this in fact i'm going to answer this one first but the this is a three-parter physique or performance or health and i've been reading a lot lately um from a exercise and nutrition perspective, that more and more people are actually embracing health, whereas in the past, that was such a nebulous goal. Like, who wants to exercise their butt off and get up at 6 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning uh, with some vague notion of lowering their cholesterol? That just doesn't seem like a huge motivator. But at least with the on, more on the nutri- nutrition side, maybe, that seems to be a big trend. Um, on the physique side, 
because we live in sort of a selfie generation, I don't think that's ever going to go away. I mean, let's face it. We've talked about no. that before. Even powerlifter and performance athletes, they like to have big mm -hmm. muscles, you know, um, at least a lot of them do or, you know, be uh, lean and that sort of thing. So I don't think physique will ever go away. Um, I do think it's almost a hybrid, though. Like the physique stuff is always going to come with a little bit more of a performance thing than it used to. You know, like the, if you talk to bodybuilders from the 90s, uh, or earlier, a lot of them would say, listen, I just want to look like I can bench 500 pounds. I really don't mm -hmm. care if I can. Uh, but now I think people do care. They don't want to be all show and no go. Uh, an mm -hmm. old strength coach buddy of mine used to say all show and no go. But in any case, I think health is sort of creeping into it too a little bit because a lot of people are realizing that bodybuilding is something you can do your whole life um, or strength training in general. Right. It's the kind of thing where like right now my knees blown out a couple of years ago. I can't jog if I wanted to. I could still go to the bodybuilding gym because there's so many varieties and different types of equipment or exercises. Uh, Phil, what do you think, though? Physique versus performance versus health uh, trending. Just, uh, performance has been on a big upswing. I think it's leveling out. I mean, I, like I said, I think that's a lot of the people getting into weightlifting and powerlifting, things like that. Um, but yeah, I think you're seeing a lot of health stuff, and I think a lot of that has to do with the age of people like me, you, Mike, Wendler, yeah. Mark. We're all reaching that point where it's like, shit, we need to think about living a few years longer. <laughs> right. So the people, the people that are the loudest are starting to get older, and we yeah. have to think about that more. So I think that's a lot of it. Is the uh, And there's going to be a whole new generation. Of course, there's a whole new generation of fitness people coming up, but still the ones that are known the most are now starting to get in their you know, 40s and 50s. Yeah. So we're starting to think, hey, man, I can't think so much about performance now. I actually need to think about health. So yep. uh, I think you're, you're hearing a lot of that. So I just heard that, again, my little trip up to Streetsboro to that new gym, about how a lot of the old timers, the most well-known and hardcore guys – um, I was told they're now 60, and I'm like, yeah, man, exactly. yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, what about you, Mike, physique, performance, or health? I mean, I would actually say health, um, which is probably the first year I think I've said that, and again, maybe it's because it's my own bias, possibly, mm -hmm. but uh, and I think it'll kind of start with the, the crazy, in air quotes, biohackers switching to longevity stuff now seems to be the most popular thing, which that's a whole separate discussion we won't go into right now. But it, I think that's kind of the bleeding edge of what's considered healthy to some degree. Um, and like Phil said, uh, you know, people getting older and I think with more testing coming out, it's going to be easier to see changes. Um, I think that there'll be more people kind of and other companies helping people kind of do their own blood work. Just simple stuff. You know, if you're really training for to reduce your cholesterol, hey, now maybe come to a point where it's pretty inexpensive to run a blood panel every month or every other month or something like that. So you kind of have a little bit more of a marker instead of chasing these nebulous things. Um, yeah, and I think it also depends on just... <laughs> Maybe your own internal goals. And like we said, we're all kind of getting older. So this could be my bias. And then the last part, too, is I've had some friends like Dr. Ben House and other people present to uh, medical conferences just on basic hypertrophy training for muscle health or kind of muscle centric medicine. Mm -hmm. And it's always kind of shocking to me that to a lot of healthcare professionals, this is pretty new. And I'm not blaming them because they just haven't had any education and it's not part of the whole medical system really at all. But I think when we live in the exercise physiology world, we just assume that this everybody else must know this stuff. And the reality is they, they don't and they just haven't had exposure to it. And it's a new thing for a lot of people. Right. Yeah. No, I love it. Yeah. The muscle centric me medicine. I haven't heard that term before said like that, but that's that makes a lot of sense. Totally. Yeah. Um, you know, I was just watching a couple of videos. I might even put them on YouTube uh, about what's going to happen in the next 10 years. But the, the, the advances in AI are going to solve a lot of problems. Um, it's it, literally the next five to 10 years. And I don't just mean self-driving Tesla cars or something like that, because that's coming too. Uh, but in the next 10 years, stuff like the personalized medicine, you know, like targeted immunotherapies, uh, yep. to cure different kinds of cancers and things like that. You are, I think in the next 10 years, you're going to see differences 
because this is also the turn of a decade. Sometimes I forget that, you know, mm-hmm. uh, or I think technically it's next year, isn't it? <laughs> I think 2021, but yeah, whatever, te- whatever, <laughs> whatever. Um, we're in the 2020s. Um, mm-hmm. And I think there's going to be changes that just blow people away in longevity. Um, you know, uh, people literally interfacing their brains, you know, through Neuralink and that kind of stuff with uh, almost unlimited information, stuff like that. It's going to change a lot of things. So yeah. we already see some of that, I would say, in a, a negative way from. Hey, test your biome. We'll tell you what foods to eat and we'll test your genetics and tell you exactly what you need to do for exercise. And I think those things have something to to be related to, of course. But I'd say right now we're just barely on the bleeding edge of even knowing what to do with that information. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think in the in the meantime, you're going to see a lot of overselling of that when it's probably just not quite ready yet. Right. But I do agree that it's definitely coming. Yeah. Not yet yeah. actionable kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Um, in fact, my parents, I got 23 and me kits for them because they were interested in just different genetic traits. Yeah. You know, oh, they'd say, yeah, your X percent, um, gene profile similar to this region of the world. If you take it with a grain of salt and you don't think it's completely actionable, then it's fun. Right. But right now it's more just fun. But when it comes to stuff like take some cells out of your bloodstream, treat them in different biomedical ways, put them back in and now kill your cancer. Wow, <laughs> that's a yeah. big deal. Yeah. That's a big deal. Um, yeah. Okay, but that's not one year from now. That's sort of uh, reaching out. Uh, next question for Phil, gender or age as far as being in the fitness spotlight? Because we just talked about how we're aging and it's our bias, but which of the two are going to take the spotlight? Like sex, like boy, girl, or age? <laughs> gender, <laughs> gender will never. It's always the women. You know, if you want to, just looking at this, I mean, if you look at social media, if I put up a picture of one of my dudes squatting 900 pounds, or I put up a picture of one of my ladies doing like kettlebell swings, the, <laughs> the women's one is going to get more hits. Yes. It just is. Yep. You know, and I can't change that. You know, it doesn't matter what I do. Right. Yeah. Um, there's a reason why influencers and stuff are greatly female. So, mm-hmm. uh, and even now, I mean, I think. The females being in powerlifting is the biggest reason why it's bigger. Oh, uh, yeah. It has more yeah. spotlight on it. Yeah. You know, and they're more enjoyable to watch, in my opinion, right now, because the men's records right now, maybe once a year you'll see a world record broken. But the females are on such an upswing that it, it's constantly something new is being done. So it's more interesting. Yeah. So. Yeah. The raw equity aspect of it all, too. Like, why wouldn't yeah. women do these things? You know, and it's OK to have a, a big muscular um, butt, uh, you know, or back or, or whatever. And sort of embracing almost different value system, kind of. Uh, what about you, Mike, as far as gender or age in trends as far as fitness spotlight? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Phil. I mean, I think that's probably not really going to change that much. (laughs) Um, I was at a conference actually a few months ago and uh, just people were at the conference. We're just hanging out, having some barbecue down in in Texas and talking to the one person. She just happened to be sitting next to me and she's like, I said, oh, where are you from? I said, I noticed you have an accent. She's like, oh, I'm from Russia. I live in LA or whatever and got her name and she's even very nice, whatever. And, and later someone's like, you don't know who that is. I'm like, no, I have no idea who that is. (laughs) You look her up on Instagram and she's got, I don't know how many, like millions of followers, you know, and it's mm-hmm. basically just the standard thing you would expect to see on Instagram, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't think unless you're the rock or something like that, you're, you're going to see that many followers and mm-hmm. we can debate later if that's really actionable or not. But I also think like Phil said, it's, it's exciting to watch. I mean, what Steffi Cohn just broke some other record again, recently again, yeah. um, so I think it's also more because, you know, people want to see records broken. And right now, it's more female athletes are doing that than male athletes, too. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, uh, from my perspective, a lot of it is niche specific. So I, I don't think I disagree with either of you guys. But like, for example, enhanced female bodybuilding has been gone for years. I mean, I not to uh, offend a lot of people, but, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it, the way it used the way it evolved to, let's say, into the 90s. Um, is just kind of gone but that doesn't mean that women's physique isn't a big deal so some of it is 
you know, again, niche specific like that. I would think, though, that overall fitness wellness age is getting more and more momentum as far as people in their 50s. They look like people used to in their 40s or 30s. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And they're more interested in saying, hey, I'm not willing to just throw in the towel here, you know, kind of thing. And you see that in some of the cheesy supplement commercials on TV and everything else. And like Phil said, maybe it's just the aging population or maybe it's it is my bias. Like you guys, as we get older, we're surrounded by other older guys from our generation, you know, or gals. Um, but yeah, I think both of these things are sort of trends. I'll agree on I'll agree on that one. I mean, one thing that me and my wife talk about a lot is I think our generation of people compared to our parents' generation takes a lot more stock in their own care. Yes. You know, I see my parents' generation, what do they do? They go directly to the doctor and get whatever pill the doctor says. Yes. Whereas you see people in our generation take more like, hey, what can I do about this? Yeah. You know? yep. So yeah, being part of your own health care and grab yes. one hand on the steering wheel kind of thing. Yeah, yep. I think that's what we do because we're better informed because of the Internet or whatever. Yes. Unfortunately, sometimes we're misinformed because of the Internet. Well, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, but yeah, for sure. Uh, the last one before break. Raw or equipped as far as 2020? Phil. I'm gonna, everybody's going to follow me. I'm going to be a trendsetter. <laughs> U-turn. <laughs> back, back to I put equipped. On my suit for the, I put on my squat suit for the first time Wednesday and squat on it. So once I start putting up Instagram videos, it's over. It's all going equipped, baby. Right back you to equipped. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I was amazed to hear this, but talking to people that made the uh, – that were on the inside of that West Side versus the World uh, movie that – Equipped lifting, the number of people doing it has not changed. Really? Uh, huh. Yeah, one would think it would be greatly down. No, down, what happened right. is Raw has just exploded. Uh. Uh, so it's it's overshadowed. But uh, I think it's you're not going to stop. the uh, Raw is just too inviting. It's open to anybody. Um, there's zero cost. General, I mean, in general, like you don't have to have a belt to do it. You can just go in and lift. Um Whereas with the equip stuff, it's like you need training partners to know what the hell they're doing. You need people to help you in your suit. You need this. You need that. Um, you need the money to buy these things. They wear out. You need to buy another one. Um, yeah. So I think I, I think the huge upswing in, in raw lifting is is not going to stop. I mean, I think the, the equip lifting is on a downswing or just maybe just stagnant. But yeah, it's fun. It's fun to try something new. You know, like I said, I got in my suit for the first time. And I'll get in there today and actually do something kind of heavy. But I went up to just 500 pounds on Wednesday. And, uh, yeah, I'll throw some wraps on with it today and see what's up. Yeah. So, felt good, though, huh? Yeah, I felt real good. I mean, it's very supportive of my hips well, with where they're at. So right. it'll yeah. be – and it's fun at this age to try something – like, it's time to learn something new. Yeah. <laughs> you know, okay. and that's neat. Yeah, it's something different. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, Mike, what about you? Raw versus equipped. I mean, you could talk about almost any – strength or muscle sport but raw versus equipped yeah i would still say i would still say raw i mean i think equipped kind of has a potential where the biggest lifts ever done are probably going to still be equipped the, the downside is as a technology gets further and further advanced the ability for anybody to relate to that it just goes out the window Right, yes. so it's like some guy in a triple ply canvas that takes four big dudes with eyeballs to stick them into a suit that goes down four inches, and I agree, it's incredibly impressive. Not anywhere close to anything I'll ever do in my lifetime. But to the average person watching, they're like, "What? What? What? What, what is all that stuff? Like, what's going on?" You know, or you see someone go up with basically no equipment and do you know something that's less. That's kind of more relatable, right? It's like. Mm -hmm. Strongman, people were way more impressed that I flipped a 400-pound tire years ago than I pulled 400 in a deadlift. Yeah. Oh, my God, you flipped a 400-pound tire. I'm like, that's a pretty small tire, actually. That's amazing! And it's like the average <laughs> average person has, like, no frame of reference, really. So to see lifts being done raw, I think, makes it more relatable and makes it more inviting, like Phil said. You don't have to have all this other stuff. You know, you can just start um, lifting without a huge impetus to everything else. Yeah. Yeah, I would think the more fiddly bits of any kind is going to make people worry. Like, I don't want to look like a fool. Yeah. Am I using this wrong? You know, or did I buy the wrong thing and just waste 
two hundred dollars, you know, kind yeah, of thing. Plus like the that. investment and just it's, it's, there's more things, moving parts to get into it. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, from a bodybuilding perspective, I'm not sure there was really that in the same manner. There was a lot of uh, extraneous equipment per se. I mean, you know, stuff like straps, wrist straps, and things like that. Maybe um, knee wraps, that kind of thing. Um, I would think if the population gets older they might embrace different kinds of equipment, but that's almost for orthopedic <laughs> kinds of reasons, yeah. you know. <laughs> kind of, but. Okay, let's go to break. When we come back, I've got some uh, nutrition and supplementation questions for the guys. Uh, and we'll be back. Hello, dear ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, you know who this is. Uh, so I'm here to tell you about uh, Dr. Mike T. Nelson's uh, new book, uh, Why You Should Eat Keto. I don't do it because, I mean, look at me. Come on, I'm fabulous and I'm fantastic. Anyway, you should text the uh, Keto ebook all in one word to 44222 to receive your free copy. Do it. Do it now. Can't stop feeling. Some of us don't understand how lucky we are to be living in this. Hi, listeners. This is Rob Fortress Fortney. I'm here to remind you that as the holiday season approaches and your thoughts turn to giving, we like you to keep Iron Rated in your thoughts. Over the past several years, there have been hundreds of listener comments hoping that Iron Radio stays on the air for years to come. Iron Radio is here for you. But as with any public radio-type format, the show is listener-supported. That's where you come in. For just $4 a month, you become a supporting member, keeping your weekly dose of education, experts, and gym talk flowing. Just go to www.ironradio.org and click on the $4 monthly subscribe button near the bottom of the page. Or... Click the Donate button at the right of the page for a one-time donation. You are the Iron Brotherhood and Sisterhood. Of course, not everyone can afford to be a supporting member or a significant one-time donor. But for those of you willing to pitch in $4 per month or $50 just once, we're about to sweeten the deal. Become a supporting member or major donor between now and January, and a limited number of you will receive a gift worth over $20. And we will never forget our existing supporters. Simply email me via ironradio.org, and I'll send you a free seminar from Dr. Lowry on how to significantly and realistically boost your testosterone levels. Help your iron brothers and sisters who cannot pitch in but deserve better internet programming in our sports. And happy holidays. Hey listeners, this is Dr. Lonnie Lowry. If you've ever had anyone critique you uh, on your protein intake as part of your weightlifting lifestyle, oh, you poor meathead, all that extra protein is going to rot your kidneys or weaken your bones or dehydrate you or give you gout or who knows what. Uh, there is a book available. You could simply Google CRC Press and Lowry. And what I've done is reach out to experts all over the world and create a book, a single compendium that you can hold up and say, this is why I consume extra protein. This can be very valuable when you're um, being quote unquote educated uh, by various professionals on the topic. Uh, there's enormous amount of literature in this book on the safety, uh, the effectiveness, how protein works in cells, the history of protein and weight trainers, uh, much more. So again, please check out CRC Press and Protein and Lowry. You can just Google that, and uh, I do, full disclosure, I do make a small single-digit uh, royalty on the book, but that's not why I did it. I did it so we can all have something, uh, our particular population, uh, to both defend what we do and to inform our nutrition and our eating. Thanks. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. 
If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. All right, everyone, we're back in 2020. So Iron Radio discussion, the second half of this show here, as far as the quick fire uh, prediction type questions. Uh, Mike, let's start with you on this one. Uh, we just had some guests on the show, but diet trend for the coming year or so, keto or paleo? Oh, man, uh, I'd probably still have to go with keto. I mean, I think I I think paleo, just like anything else, right? So at some point, something gets so big, it just fractured into a, a smaller pieces, right? And I think that's kind of where CrossFit is at. The peak was probably a couple of years ago, and what you're seeing now is just fracturing into smaller pieces. I think the same thing with paleo. Um, I think the same thing will happen with keto probably by the end of this year. It's kind of my prediction. And I think maybe keto would be replaced by carnivore, right? I mean, the whole mm-hmm. fitness industry has something where we have to be more extreme. You know, I was doing some fasting stuff 12 years ago. My prediction was, eh, I don't know if fasting will ever be a thing, but it probably will because it's more extreme. And when that happens, you're going to see longer and longer fasts just for the hell of it. Oh, I did 32 hours. Oh, I did a seven day. Oh, I did a five day. You know, just almost as this inevitable pissing match to see who can be more hardcore. Right. Yeah. <laughs> discipline kind of thing. I barely yeah. hear the word paleo anymore. But yeah. like, I was sitting down at a Mexican restaurant on Wednesday and two older people behind me were like, yeah, that starts tomorrow. I got to get back in ketosis and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. I think they're, that's really se- seeped into the mainstream a lot, right? I mean, yeah. um, when Atkins was so popular, which was very much like, I think, precursor to what people now call ke- uh, keto, I would think. Yep. Um, it. I, I once read in a marketing journal that Atkins brand name recognition was the highest of any product in history. And that's wow. kind of amazing. Yeah, um, it is. And if you think about that, it's partly because you do get immediate benefits. A lot of people might think it's fat loss when, in fact, it's just glycogen and water loss for the first week or something. But, um, yeah, lower – I think it's almost like what CrossFit did to strength training. What keto does or paleo or some of these other diets is they introduce people to lower carbohydrate diets. And I mm-hmm. think that has a lot of advantage from aging and just a lot of perspectives, actually. Um, so – but like Mike said, yeah. the the fracturing comment, I like that a lot. That's mm-hmm. that that is what people in our in our sports, because discipline is part of lifting, we automatically almost over embrace, and like you said, it becomes a pissing match kind of thing. Well, and also money. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's the other part I was going to say. It's, yeah, it's Products. money over there. Yeah, it's pro- and and somebody within that larger organization decides they need deserve more money, so they start their own, and you see it. You've seen it in powerlifting. You've seen it in kettlebells. Like kettlebells for the longest time, when we were all young and just getting together going in this, it was all RKC. Yeah. And then, <laughs> then it fractured into all this other stuff. <laughs> and all it's follow the money. You know? Right. So yep. everything fractures off eventually. And yeah. 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 And I think that was a boom to keto having, you know, ketogenic salts, esters, other products that, you know, do have some legitimacy behind them. I mean, they will increase beta hydroxybutyrate levels. I think they're all, you know, almost completely misused by the mass, you know, public and overpromised. Um, but having a, a product that's new and unique, and people take it and they feel like, oh, my appetite's a little less. I feel like my brain works better. You know, all those things then, you know, drive everything because there's, you know, like Phil said, money behind it now too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to me, it's it's almost like the 23 and Me or some of these genetic things too. Some of this stuff we don't know yet, right? Like when it comes to, like you said, like supplemental ketosis kind of thing. Um, is beta hydroxybutyrate a side effect of 
poorly oxidized fat that you mobilized, right? Or is it yeah. is it in itself something that has an effect on your brain or other tissues, you know, as a molecule? Uh, and I think a lot of that stuff is still being teased apart, of course. But uh, okay, uh, the next one, um, Phil, plant or animal foods, as far as fitness trends and Gen Pop health trends. Animal, animal. You're seeing the carnivore thing start to take off, and that's like all 100 percent animal all the time. Um, <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> it's 50 percent more extreme. Right, um, backlash. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's you know, me and my wife were talking about this. Is like we poo poo the, the the people in the fitness industry generally look down upon the food pyramid. But honestly, if you look at it, if Gen Pop, who is who it's pointed at, just ate by that, we would be markedly better. But it's not extreme, you know. And it's always these super extreme things. I'm going to eat nothing but beef leg for the next year, you know. And it's and people tie onto that. So yeah. Largely, sadly, it's not sustainable because of how extreme it is, and that's why you see so many people dump off of it. They never learn how to to just eat for life. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, mm-hmm. but it works in the short term. So, yeah, and they latch onto a group. They they they're part of something. That's so. interesting perspective uh, because I think that's that's a unique counterculture you're going to see first among the lifters, like the carnivore type stuff. Um, like the Golden Globes, I just heard the awards. They're boasting that they're serving only plant foods, the entire menu. <laughs> and you know, and if you look at plant proteins, are all the rage, and that concerns yeah. me a little because th- they're just more incomplete by by their nature, mm-hmm. um, and that kind of thing. So I I would say, in one sense, I would I would disagree, but again, it depends on the population, right? Because yes, the Gen Pop. The Within the fitness population, I think you're seeing a push towards meat. But yeah, I agree. Within Gen Pop, you're seeing this plants, 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 plants. Right. Yeah. Um, and you know, honestly, vegetarianism it arguably is not always the most sustainable either, from a global health and no. la- land use perspective. Yeah. A- and you would think it, it is, but it's not necessarily. What about you, Mike? So we all bump into different, you know, people as we go through yeah. life. Plant or animal? I- I'm going to take a weasel word answer, and I'm going to go with the bimodal distribution. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say that both of them are going to go up, but in probably different areas, and then they're just going to bash each other, which is going to drive both of them back up. Yeah. Right, so you're going to see the plant people going at the carnivore people, and that's going to make the average person more interested in potentially picking one side or the other. So we all like tribalism. We all want to yeah. have something that... We can hang our hat on and say, I'm a plant-based person or I only eat animal products. And unfortunately, I think it's just going to escalate and the average person is just going to be confused as hell. Confused. <laughs> yes. You know, that that's what happened with the gluten thing. Because gluten-free, yep. gluten-free, but then as health food stores got into low-carb, a lot of the low-carb breads are heavy on the gluten, right? Because that's protein. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they would kind of boast, oh, more protein. It's like, yeah, but that's gluten. Mm-hmm. And then people walk into the health food store and just get confused as hell. Like, his, I yeah. thought gluten was bad. Now it's good? Anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, similar to that, Phil, I'm interested in your perspective because you're there in, like, sort of the heartland. Um, I guess arguably Mike and I are, too, except we're just more north. But um, genetically modified and tech, tech-produced foods or natural organic foods? God. I th- in the short term, I think you're still going to see it push towards more natural organic foods. <laughs> Um, at least within the fitness industry, I honestly think the gen pop people just don't really give a shit. I think the mass percentage of the population doesn't care about their diet at all. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I think within our, our subset, uh, you're seeing still a more push towards natural and organic and things like that. And they don't, people can't, they can't grasp that it's all about being part of a group. They can't grasp that something changed can be good. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of weird. You know, and I I've always agreed with you. It's like a little bit of both, you know. Yeah. So No, I understand. Uh, I mean, I I think I've mentioned this in the past and I I show some um evidence on this in, in the classroom, but the FDA, oh god, it was more than a decade ago. They actually issued a warning that natural does not equal good, right? And if something is synthetic, yeah. it doesn't equal bad. And I always yes. use the the funny analogy of a poison ivy salad. Natural? Yes. Yeah. Would you eat it? No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. But um, 
what about you, Mike? What do you think? GMO and tech modified, right? And, and tech modified could be everything from lab grown meats to who knows what, right? Uh, versus the natural organic thing. Uh, if I had to pick, I'd still say kind of natural organic, but oddly enough, a lot of big food companies like we saw even at IFT a couple of years ago are using technology to make quote unquote, like the industry word is a clean label, right? Because they're trying to get away from the word natural, like you talked about. Um, but they're using, would we have like a stevia taste testing of like three different types of stevia and nope, now stevia is out and we can't use Splendex. That's, you know, that's a modified thing. It's a chemical. Mm -hmm. It's bleach. Um, it's bleach, right? With just extra <laughs> molecules on it. Right. Jeez. <laughs> um, you know, so now it's monk fruit or, you know, mm. whatever. And I think a lot of those things are a, a good thing. I mean, if I'm a consumer, and I look at it and it doesn't have a bunch of weird colors and other stuff in it that, you know, I know where it comes from. Yeah, I, I will admit mm -hmm. I'm probably more likely to yeah. buy it. Um, but I think that trend is just kind of going to continue. But it's always odd to me because a lot of it is actually driven by technology <laughs> no that's right and, you know food technologists food science is not nutrition what, what i do right nutrition no. is or mike we, we we do after you swallow right yeah the f <laughs> food scientists are sort of the before you swallow and the, and the food technology industry has done great things and real blunders over the decades like you know, developing trans fat margarine to replace real butter. That was a mm, blunder. Nice. Whoops, you know. Nice and for the longest time, people thought that was actually a healthier alternative, right, to the saturated yeah. fat butter. And now we realize, oh, man, not so much. You know, and there's a lot of things like that. I would argue that the um, very low fat or fat free peanut butter was kind of a blunder, right? You take the healthy mono and saturated fat out, and what do you put in? Sugar and filler. It's like, well, that was stupid, you know, yeah. uh, and yet there have been really good things, too, and some of them even genetically modified. So there's definitely pros and cons uh, with technology, and we have a, a, a checkered track record <laughs> of messing mm -hmm. with Mother Nature in that way. But, yeah, when it comes to things like lab-grown meats or vertical farming, people can go look that up. I mean, there's some very interesting things as far as. I mean, agriculture feeds the vast majority of human beings on this planet, and we can't completely ignore it, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I think GMO would be a bigger issue because of the labeling that we talked about in a past episode around it, and I think that will come up quite a bit this coming year is my prediction. Yeah, I'm actually um, – I would side a, with GMO if I had to. Um, I, 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 like we were talking about ecosystem and stuff, there are definitely concerns it's filling weird niches that, you know, and bumping out naturally evolved, you know, um, plants or even animals or insects in that area. And there's a lot of kind of ecosystem things. Personally, I'm not a big fan of the GMO free label that's on everything. I think that's more marketing um, oh. than it is, you know, any kind of demonstrable health detriment that you would get from eating something. That was, in fact, tweak genetically. Um, but, you know, I guess time will tell. Uh, uh, moving down the list, though, um, Phil, uh, drugs or supplements or specialty diets? Which, which is going to be the trend? Drugs, supplements, or specialty diets? Oh, God. It's supplements are kind of on a downturn. I think it's especially of all those, uh, I, I can't deny drugs are still there. And they always will be. They just won't be talked about as much, just like normal. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. That's the only difference. Yeah. Uh, so it, as far as media goes, definitely specialty diets. Um, again, it's being part of a group. So mm -hmm. that's the main thing. And then hidden behind that is the drugs. Like, oh, it was carnivore that turned me this way. It wasn't the two grams of trend. <laughs> <laughs> so, the drugs will be hidden behind the specialty diets right so. yeah ignore the fact the guy's got trend cough <laughs> yeah exactly. so i think it'll be the specialty diets is the thing you'll hear about the most I, i'm i'm on board with that too um it, it's definitely the special specialty diets in many ways i think uh, the dietary supplements aren't going to go anywhere either but i think as far as the d discussions around the gym and that kind of stuff it's more often yeah, what diet, especially diet you're on, not what herbal testosterone booster you're hoping for, you know, as far as a pill or powder kind of thing. Uh, Mike, what about you? Drugs or supplements or specialty diets? 
I mean, I would probably agree with what you guys said just from the – it's a weird thing because if you see someone in the gym who's made, you know, let's say unrealistic changes, it's probably chemically assisted, especially if they've been, you know, lifting for quite a while and we're not just brand new to it and that kind of thing. There's you know, always a freak hyper responders and stuff. But then they have to tell you about what their either fancy new Russian-based training program was or what their crazy specialty diet was. And that, unfortunately, I think further perpetuates those kind of things, right? Just open any supplement ad, right? Some, you know, bodybuilder who's obviously chemically enhanced showing you, oh, it's this new supplement I took that this is the reason for it. It's like, okay, whatever. Right. Uh, but we forget that, you know, a lot of people are new to the the sport and the industry and, that's what they see and that's kind of what their impression is and i i do think drugs probably won't be talked about because they just historically have not been although Mm -hmm. maybe that's changing a little bit with you know russia getting thrown out of the olympics and a bunch of (laughs) other stuff um but i do think now especially with uh peptides and research chemicals and stuff like that that are definitely more in the gray area that we don't really have a lot of data behind but we also know that you you know testing is probably quite a ways behind, so I think there will be a, a big expansion in that kind of new area of underground stuff. Um, but again, in terms of mass uh, media and public, I don't think people are going to hear about that. I was just going to say, I think we all lived through the heyday of the supplement industry. Oh yeah, and oh, we're yeah. not going to see that big again. It was huge. Yeah. You know, remember the Olympia when all it was was supplement companies, right? Yeah, and things like that, and we lived through that era, and then all the bans came out, and the restrictions, and we're we're never going to reach that area again where you can make shit on your kitchen counter and yeah. have a company, right? You know? Yes, right. <clears throat> so, um, I, I was just going to comment that um, I think uh, to Mike's point, uh, that's just what I was thinking. If you remember, like when I was talking about how there, it used to be almost a a secret club, good old boys network, the power lifters and bodybuilders. Uh, and a lot of the dietary supplement stuff has gone in a similar trend from that group toward gen pop. Like for example, what used to be, well, like pro hormones. And then you got these like designer steroids or these investigational new drugs that were adrenergic agents, right? Adrenaline like compounds, like variations yeah. on ephedrine or clenbuterol and uh, all these what a lot of people call asthma drugs or uh, peptides, like you said, Mike. And and now with SARMs, right, that yeah. brings a lot of stuff into this. People are willing, and I don't just mean the, the, the good old boys network, good old girls network. I mean the gen pop. Um, mm-hmm. Young, interested people are willing to experiment with stuff that could be pretty dangerous and sketchy because mm-hmm. the very thing that makes it not illegal or legal makes it, um, uh, uninformed. Dangerous. Yes, right. Yeah. It leaves us uninformed and potentially in a dangerous situation. Yeah, but so I mean that's where I think a lot of the drugs are going. For it, even not just peptides or or designer steroids or SARMs, but even like nootropics and stuff like that. People are willing to try stuff. Like one paper comes out on this, you know, um, analog or this chemically modified version of something that's a known drug, and then. Yeah, a lot of young people are actually just trying it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, like you said, it's all about being not misinformed, non-informed. Yeah. And they're, they're like, <laughs> right. well, nothing, nothing says it's bad for you, so I'll take it. Yeah, but nothing says it's safe. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's because nothing says anything. It doesn't mean you should take it. Right. You know, it's not studied at all. Right. It sounds edgy so, and hardcore, but in fact, yeah. what happens when it's like some of those designer, like, pre and pro steroids and pro hormones that came out like if it's all secondary sexual characteristics oh no i have a pro uh, i'm hairy and acne and a swollen prostate and it didn't do a damn thing for my muscles whoops (laughs) whoops my Um, liver is twice the size whoops right exactly i've scarred my liver forever great um yeah i think that's the downside people a lot of times will confuse that if it's legal or illegal that Oh well, this is you know quasi legal. It must be safe. It's like yeah, no, not not at all. I mean, you could easily argue that we have way more data on testosterone, which yes. is technically kind of considered illegal for most sports, than any of the other SARMs that are out, just because mm-hmm. we have actual data on it. Right. Yeah. So that's yes. what makes me kind of nervous, and especially with the peptide stuff. Like people I know in the industry will flat out tell you that 
80, maybe 90% of the peptides that are sold are probably just trash anyway. Because yeah. if you're an unscrupulous company, eh, you know, it's not in your probably best interest to, you know, do all the nice things with manufacturing and everything else and traceability and whatever. If you can just sell something, people buy it, and then you mm-hmm. kind of close shop and pop up under a different name right. somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, not just dangerous chemical tweaks, but, yeah, uh, contaminants and stuff like that. Oh, right? yeah. yeah. Especially sure. if you're doing injectable stuff. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just wanted to say one last thing on this question before we move on. But I, I think uh, once Tim Patterson said something that I thought was very true, he's like, regardless of your training program, right, is a, a, an adhered to hard training program is such a potent stimulus uh, mm-hmm. that it almost doesn't matter which training program you're on. I mean, as far as doing picking one and doing it relatively properly, but to, to the point about the drug supplements and specialty diets, people in our field, they have such a po- exercise is such a potent stimulus um, oh, yeah. for fat loss and muscle gain that they can, they can attribute it to a supplement or a, a investigational mm-hmm. med or a diet when in fact, no, you're just training your ass off, bro. Yep. You know, uh, so something to think about. Yeah, there's a peer review article I read recently that's talking about how the placebo effect with athletes is just very high. And I'd be super interested to see, I don't know if IRB would ever approve it, but a study where it's basically both are placebo compounds, but the price is different. You know, because if you're spending, say, $200 on some crazy supplement per month, odds are you're probably going to eat better and train a lot better too. You know, it's going to maybe you see positive effects just because of that too. And there's like two or three studies that did um, uh, placebo with steroids. And what they showed was pretty remarkable gains, even though it was a placebo, but mm-hmm. they told them it was a steroid. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah. So that's always fascinating. I remember that. I remember reading that paper yeah. years ago and people made, yeah, yeah um, studies. definitely above normal gains. Right. Because oh yeah. They, sure. they thought. Yeah. Yeah. Last one, uh, and this is very broad. And again, this is just, I know these are seemingly closed-ended, but the point is, like I said, seeds for conversation. So, Phil, um, technology or old school, just in general? So this could be like monitoring yourself with a device versus a training log. It could be new materials in support gear versus old school. Um, do you think trends are going to be more tech, tech-embraced or old school? Depends on the population you're in. Gen pop, definitely tech, because like we talked about earlier, the Peloton and things like that. And the mirror that's out now, have you guys seen that thing? Like you basically no, stand in front of It's this body length mirror you stand in front of them. There's a person on there telling you what to do. Um, oh, so I you go through like that. a fitness program right yeah. there and you sign up. It's $30 a month. You have personal trainers and they walk you through a program. So gen pop, definitely towards the uh, technology. I think you're still seeing within like strength sports and stuff. Uh, it becomes it keeps it keeps becoming more and more old school. Like let's simplify shit, <laughs> and mm-hmm. like it really worked. Look, those guys got strong back in the days with barely weights, you know, <laughs> and things like that. So, mm-hmm. uh, I guess from you, Phil, I was curious about new materials too, like it, an old neoprene knee sleeve versus some new fancy material or something that replaced denim. Oh, there's denim. always something pushing you know, there. Yeah, there's yeah. always something everybody's always trying to push push the envelope. Like, like I had a conversation with about, you know, some guy was asking me about my bench shirt and suit and like how they were originally, uh, I was explaining they originally were supportive gear to help you last longer. And like Cone will tell you, he got like 20 pounds out of his shirt and maybe 30, 40 pounds out of his suit. And then of course, then it became a business. And then yeah. it was always what can get tougher, 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 tougher. And it just offshooted into this thing that was no longer about, safety and support and about how much you can move yeah. Uh, um, yeah how far can we push this thing and that'll always be relevant you know it's just like drag racing you know the first time it happened then well let's start tinkering you yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> and what do we got to do to make this thing faster right so um that'll always be <clears throat> relevant so yeah sometimes i wonder if i mean there are traditional materials or ways to monitor things like a diet log or a training log. And I just think they're always going to be valid in one sense. Like maybe it's just cotton or old school neoprene or whatever, you know. And uh, yeah, it, maybe it is a gen pop versus uh, competitor type thing. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Mike, what about you? I mean, I know you're as an engineer and you do a lot of monitoring and that kind of stuff. Tech versus old school as a forward looking trend. Yeah, I agree with Phil. I'd say general population is always looking at whatever the next technological thing is. And I think if you're younger, that's probably more true because, I mean, and you can attest to this too, Lonnie, and even probably the people you train, Phil, that the students I teach have never known what it's like to not have the internet. Mm -hmm. So I think they're almost used to technology solving a lot of problems. So I think that's kind of the expectation or maybe some of the uh, older curmudgeon lifters like ourselves are, I think, going more backwards. And I think you're actually seeing a little bit more backlash against technology, whether that's um, velocity based training or I get anytime someone writes an article why they don't like heart rate variability, it gets sent to me. <laughs> um, and I think that it's it's interesting but i think with the technology part is you know a lot of the stuff that i've tested because you know i'll buy stuff and play around with it because i'm interested in it yeah i i've got a whole basket full of stuff here i don't really use anymore per se um i still use hrv and some other stuff that's useful but i think it can be a benefit if you're trying to figure out uh why but i think most people are trying to do it as a prediction of the future <laughs> hey if i do this thing it will predict if i have a good day at the gym or not Probably not. We're probably not going to ever get to the point where one thing is going to predict your performance per se. Um, so I think technology will still be there. But I think you're seeing people kind of just going back to the basics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My pet peeve is as much as I love technology and I've got a freaking moxie and a metabolic cart sitting in my kitchen. Um, it, <sighs> People want to use technology to skip the basics, right? Yep. Just go to any big gym and like, how many people even wrote down what they did? It's yeah. like, if you're not even following the concepts of <laughs> overload, just don't worry about measuring 17 other things when you wake up in the morning. So, but I think you're hoping yeah. back to that area. And from the practical standpoint, which I can speak from, you know, being a gym owner and this and that, I can tell you that the people that are performing the best and making the biggest gains are the ones that are just simply doing it. Oh, yeah. Just simply working hard, going old school and just hard work. And the ones that are messing around with technology the most and doing the latest stretching and this and that, they're the weakest. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, Interesting. Just work hard. Just go fucking work hard. Right. And yeah. it'll happen. You know, and that's really what what changes you. In the end, like you talked about with Tim Patterson, it's just doing something with a purpose will get you great results. Mm-hmm. So uh, one last thing for you, Phil, and then we'll, we'll be done, I guess. But you still write shit down, don't you? <laughs> like you don't use yeah, Excel. I, I, I can't. I just write on paper. Yeah. yeah. For everybody. It's like, yeah. So yeah. I like it better that way. And, but I'm also I don't if I have a choice, I'm going to read a paper book, not an ebook. <laughs> yeah. I wonder how much of that is generational too. you know, like audio book versus read a book um, or Excel versus write it down. You know, mm -hmm. it, it'd be interesting. I live, off, I live off notes and yeah, I got, I'm looking at 50 pages with scribbled stuff on them in front of me. Right. So. No, exactly. That's like, I like to scribble in the margin and make notes and draw arrows. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow yeah. it helps me retain it, you know? Yeah. So. Especially with clients I train, I, I try to tell them and like, and I sometimes get a lot of pushback on this too, that yeah, I'll update your training stuff electronically just because it's easier for me to yes. track. But when you go to the gym, my preference is just get an old school notebook, write it down before you go in. And if you want to log some stuff electronically after for record keeping, I, that's what I do. That's fine. But I just don't even like people being on their phone and having yep. to try to update it. And yeah. I get some text messages of, oh, I couldn't update this field when I'm at the gym. And it's like, man, even having to go on your phone and switch tasks mm -hmm. like 52 times just to log your training, I don't know, it just, maybe I'm old and curmudgeon but it just feels backwards, and I think you're not getting the most productive thing you could out of that session. Yeah. I like the idea of the old school stuff. When you write stuff down, instead of something being automatically logged, for example, is you're pumping the brakes and you're becoming aware of it, you know, and to me, yes. there, there's advan there's an advantage in that, but you can quickly go back and look too i mean i have you know electronic stuff but in a notebook i just transferred to a new notebook because i filled up mm -hmm. my other one already i have little notes in the back of you know what are my kind of prs on stuff i'm trying to achieve and there's always something cool about 
Oh, wow, I did more reps. Okay, cool. I get to put the little entry in the back of the notebook now, you know, and just yeah. uh, at any glance, I can flip back to, you know, especially when I travel, I'd flip back to four months ago when I was at that same location at the same gym. So mm -hmm. now I can compare equipment to see where I'm at, too. So mm -hmm. control. Yeah. yeah. All right, everybody. Well, there's your, um, you know, just quick fire prediction type questions uh, out of us. So, um, you know, have a good 2020. We'll see you next yep. week. Yeah. You know, and that'll be it. Thanks a lot. Hey, listeners, have you seen the store at ironradio.org? There are three halls in the store, one for Phil, one for Fortress, and one for myself, Dr. Lowry, and they're thematic. So you can go into our Halls of Iron store and choose based on your goal. If you need something to learn or read or something nutritional, you can look in my store. Uh, Lonnie's store. If you want something about injury prevention uh, or competition, then take a look at Phil's Hall of Iron. And if you want something about motivation or daily training, Fortress's Hall has what you're looking for. There are some fun heroic descriptors uh, as you browse through the stores. We try to make it a little more fun than the average boring online store. And whether you're a novice lifter or someone more experienced, you can take heart that you're not wasting your time. The things that we put in each hall of iron are actually based on our own recommendations. Protein powders that we know to be good, uh, knee sleeves, wraps of some kind, things that Fortress uses in his own training. Uh, the stuff you, you see, you know is good. This way you don't waste time. So check out the Iron Radio store at ironradio.org and um, let us know what you think on the forums and certainly you can request products and we will uh, screen them before they go in. So thanks for listening. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding. Um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio Podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.